was it was pretty soon after uh, that that situation had happened. We had brought our daughter back, and we had gone through that with our with Hannah. Um, I, I remember there was my wife would just begin to call me periodically every once in a while, and she would just tell me that she had fallen. She'd been out shopping, or she'd been somewhere, and she goes, "I don't know what happened. I'm just I'm clumsy." And I, and I just fell. And those calls became more frequent um, as time went by. And at the same time, she had also um, kind of experienced some weight loss. And so just some kind of symptoms we didn't really know what was what was going on. We, we actually went to some doctors. Initially, a lot of those doctors had kind of just dismissed some of it and, yeah. and said that, you know, she needed to eat more or um, she just wasn't getting enough calories. And so that's why she was losing weight. But we really didn't, it didn't really seem to fit with what was going on. But I remember it was it was actually one of my doctor's appointments. I, I think I was just going to the doctor for, for some reason, just a, a general physical. And for whatever reason, Melody went with me. And, and as we were walking into the room, my doctor just looks at Melody and says, hey, if you'd be willing, would you just walk down this hallway for me? So I think he just noticed her weight and how thin she was. He said, would you just walk down this hallway for me? And so she proceeded to walk down the hallway and walked back. And in that 30 seconds, he was he said, you need to go see a neurologist. And he was the first doctor who had led us in that direction. So um, mm. so we didn't know. We actually kind of had to research, like, what's a neurologist? Yeah, I had no idea what a neurologist was. We, we, we didn't know what that, what that meant um, for her. And so we quickly found out. And so we went to her first appointment. And the first thing that they do when they start to suspect some muscle uh, issues or muscle weaknesses, they kind of did all these muscle tests. And so they, they would ask Melody to, to grab her leg and, 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 or to, to, to lift her leg up. And all they had me sitting in a chair and they asked me to lift my leg up and I couldn't do it. And I was really puzzled by that. They asked me to give them a high five. And so I lifted up my hand and my fingers wouldn't stand up straight. They just kind of fell down, and I wasn't able to give a high five. And I thought, "Man, what's going on? Am I am I on a TV show? Is this a practical joke?" They had me walk on my tippy toes, and I couldn't do that either. There was about probably six or seven things that um, they had asked me to do, and I could no longer do. And I learned that. Your body just starts compensating for these losses. So I would actually be getting into a car, and I would lift my leg up to get into the car, not even realizing it. Hmm. And, just and you're a busy of, mom. Yeah. You, you, yeah, and I had no kids, idea. You're just, yeah, going through the motions and m- making life happen. Exactly. Wow. So, you know, he's going through all this and saying, you know, I think you have a form of um, a muscle-wasting disease, some kind of muscular dystrophy, but we won't know until we do further testing. I had no idea what muscular dystrophy was, what anything was that he was talking about. And we just kind of left there, got in the car, and I just started weeping because I knew that this was the start of a change in my life, you know, yeah. more loss. Yeah. I remember even growing up, of course, the Jerry Lewis telethons and right. seeing people on, uh, you know, with muscular dystrophy and raising money, and that was a big thing growing up. Um, but I don't know that I really knew anybody that had muscular dystrophy. So when you're hearing that, uh, yeah, it just becomes all of a sudden – you realize life change is coming. Yeah, and there was no frame of reference for anything for me. I had nothing to go off of. Um, I learned that there are like 300 different forms of wow. muscular dystrophy. Um, and so we wouldn't even find out what type of muscular dystrophy I had for a few years. Um hmm. So, yeah, that, that period of time I'm waiting was really difficult not knowing what to expect for my life and when this, what's actually going to look like. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, and they finally did. We, you know, after that, probably a year or so of, of doing some additional testing, they, they finally did identify the type of muscular dystrophy. And so Melody has a, uh, what they call Desmond myofibular myopathy. And so it's really just a slow, progressive muscle wasting disease. So just over time, her muscles continue to get weak. So in the, in the arms and in the legs, um, and so, and in the respiratory, so her respiratory muscles that begin to get weakened. It also affects the heart. Um, so over, I would say a period of, you know, since, since that diagnosis, 10 or 12 years, you know, she's gone from walking normally where we, we really didn't know anything was wrong to now being in this, you know, full-time wheelchair. Um, she uses kind of a respirator at night uh, to help her breathe. Uh, she can no longer eat. Uh, she has to use a feeding tube. And so, and we know, you know, based on the, on the prognosis, um, we know that, uh, you know, at some point in the future, likely uh, she'll, she'll need a full-time respirator um, to continue to breathe. So this is just, it's, it's one of those diseases where uh, I know I've often thought at times, Lord, if you would just allow it to get a little bit worse and then just have it stop mm -hmm. so it doesn't continue to progress because there's just something about the nature of a progressive disease that there's just a mm. constant continual grieving process. Yeah. And that, you know, there's a grief over what the losses of her abilities, but it's, there's also was a grief. And we, you know, looking back, you know, that when you get married and you stand up at the altar and you say, I do, and uh, you know, until death do we part, you know, in sickness and in health, I mean, there, we had no idea that one of us was going to have a significant disability. That's not something that you anticipate. Um, and so it's yeah. it's challenged our, our faith. It's challenged our marriage. Um, it's challenged me as a husband as I've had to take on this caregiver role. Mm -hmm. um, so passages like Ephesians 5, where Paul calls husbands to love their wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, wow. becomes this real yeah. picture to say, Lord, what what is my call mm -hmm. as a husband um, to lay down my life? As if we look at Christ's example that he laid his life down for his bride, for his, for the church, and that's what that's what my call is in this. And so mm -hmm. I've, I've really prayed. It's not something that I've done perfectly. It's there's been some ups and downs. But I, in this process, as I think about my role as a husband in this, as this has affected my wife, is Lord, how do I faithfully walk through this? How do I faithfully lay down my life for my wife um, in these mm -hmm. circumstances? Mm -hmm. Men typically are not characterized <laughs> as caregivers. Um, it's not a natural thing uh, like it is for most women. Um, and and that's, that's a generalization, I know. But, and you're right. When we stand at the altar and we say, for better, for worse, rich and poor, in sickness and in health, none of us are thinking anything's going to happen. Um, but especially as believers, we say that mm. and we mean it. Yeah. But, now you're in this situation and like you said it rocks your marriage it rocks your faith and here we are 10 or 12 years later mm -hmm. and you guys seem to have it all together <laughs> well wow. that's that's amazing yeah the lord has brought us through quite a bit and i i would say as i think about walking through difficulty and walking through suffering i think people that have walked through it before, mm. uh, any any type of suffering there's something about it that exposes our weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, I think back in the first 10 years of our marriage and, and we had issues, we were adjusting to married life and there's always challenges. Um, but then God allowed us to walk through these circumstances and those areas of our life that we just, we, we almost had uh, this, this level of confidence that you know, we, we, we were so good at this, where we can <laughs> communicate so well together. Um, there's nothing like suffering to really expose our weaknesses. And it, it's a painful thing. It, it's painful to have those weaknesses exposed. But at the end of that process, there's something stronger that comes from that. Because now we're God's making us aware and God's growing us. The Spirit is continuing to, to grow us in that, in that process. And so um, that's where I think sometimes as we, as we think about, you know, her muscular dystrophy, and I don't, I don't think we thought this way from the beginning, but God's really grown us in this idea of that, that muscular dystrophy can be a gift. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's changed our marriage in challenging ways, but it's changed our marriage in incredibly, incredibly good ways. Mm. Um, as we've uh, had to 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 learn to care for each other in a whole with a whole new perspective. Um, so it's it's um, yeah. So it's been it's been a gift in a lot of ways that we've been able to experience. Yeah. That sounds crazy, but I, I know you believe that. Um, I can tell that you believe that, and, and it makes sense. Um, Melody talked a little bit earlier, I believe it was before we started recording, about this very thing and how you're able to have a new perspective. We've talked before on the podcast of how we live in this country where we have anything we want at any time, and, and we expect it. And yet the rest of the world is not like that. And you guys, I think, have, mm-hmm. have been able to yeah. step back from that and to, yeah. to look at what really matters. And most of us aren't ever at that point. Yeah. And so we're not willing to give up all the things that our neighbors have, um, that our friends yeah. have, to be where you're at. What? Yeah, and I, I would... What? Yeah, I wouldn't want to paint a picture that that I, that I didn't go kicking and screaming at times. <laughs> um, you know, I think we've we walked through. Uh, I mean, initially we've we've had some. That's had to bring us through some low points sure. um, in this process. There's been some real challenges. I mean, we've we've gone through bouts of depression, anxiety. Um, all of that have been a real part of this process. It wasn't just hey, we had this diagnosis. The Lord has grown us, and now. Mm. And now we have this this perspective, and and we talk about this all the time. It's it's a daily battle. Every day, it's waking up. It's not something that we've attained. It's it's there's it a daily battle to say, Lord, how do I live faithfully for you today in the midst of challenges and difficulty and suffering? Hmm. And again, uh, and I appreciate Jason you explaining that because I didn't want to insinuate that I thought that you guys just magically accepted all this and God just paved the path for you. I know that there's hard work in that. And I think that what that says about you guys is that you were willing to put in that hard work because I know a lot of people just are, you know, this is too hard. Um, so, uh, you know, amazing for you guys, but I, 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 I appreciate the fact that you're willing to share that it wasn't, it wasn't easy. Um, and, and talking about day to day, um, and and the phrase that you repeated, what was that again, Melody? Fighting for joy while fighting the flesh. Sounds a lot like Paul. And and I think you guys are experiencing exactly what Paul meant. And I probably have read that passage, many passages that Paul s- spoke those words. And didn't fully understand it like you guys do. And so what my point is, is that for everybody listening and watching right now, uh, myself included, is that maybe we need a perspective shift about what's really important in our lives. So through all of this, uh, you, you guys have experienced the joys of early marriage. You have two boys. And all of a sudden, life begins to shift a little bit. You have a miscarriage. You find yourself in China, bringing home a little girl who needs your love, but also who has severe physical special needs that are required. Mm -hmm. Um, At this point, she's come through this okay, but now your minds shift to this new, uh, again, a different shift in perspective to Melody's situation with muscular dystrophy and kind of accepting all of that while still maintaining your day-to-day with three kids and jobs and all those things. Uh, But that's not where we end the story. So let's talk about Noah. Yeah. Yeah, so around the same time that my wife was being diagnosed, our son, who was nine at the time, began to complain about some mild chest pains. And so I think we had brought that up to the doctor. But Melody had actually, way before all of this, when we were dating, she had actually had a pacemaker put in. We didn't know that that was all connected but uh, to her disease that she has now, but she actually had a pacemaker put in. And so our doctor pretty quickly said, no, I, I think it'd be a good idea for you to, to, to have your boys get a, an EKG, so just a real simple test 
just to test the electrical pulses in the heart. So we, we had taken no, actually both of our boys, but we, had, we took Noah and Jonah to get an EKG. And pretty quickly after that test, we get a call from the pediatrician and she says, you need to immediately go uh, to the cardiologist. The, the test, um, I, I, I'm not, I, I can't read the test completely, but it, it, looks, it doesn't look good and, and you need to have a, a, a cardiologist interpret this test. So even, even with that urgent call, I remember, because he looked so normal, there was nothing really wrong with him from the outside. And so I, I actually didn't go to the appointment. I, I went to work and <laughs> Melody went to the appointment and, and we thought, well, it's just, you know, we're going to go to the cardiologist. They're going to look over this test and, and, and hopefully it's, it's nothing. And pretty quickly when they got to the appointment, I remember I got a call at work and, and Melody's first words to me was, they want to airlift Noah to UCLA. And I said, well, that's, that's great. Like, what? <laughs> she's, she's not usually a jokester like that when it, <laughs> when it comes to medical situations. So I, I thought, no, there's, that's, that is not happening. There's, there's no way he looked, he looked normal. And they said, no, they, 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 his EKG appears that he's in cardiac arrest and that he should be having a heart attack right now. Oh my. And so they wanted to quickly airlift him. Uh, we, I think we had convinced the doctor, so we didn't have him airlifted. We said, hey, we see it looks normal. We'll immediately go to UCLA. We'll, we'll drive straight there. So it's an hour and a half away. We'll, we'll just drive straight there. So when we, we get there and we, unbeknownst to us, we, we have a, an appointment set up with the, with the cardiac transplant team. Yeah. And we, we go in this room and, and there's all these, all the different people are represented on the, on the cardiac transplant team. And I remember my wife even joked, you know, like, oh, it's funny. We're, we're like, why are we meeting with the transplant team? That's fine. We had no idea that they had suspected that Noah had a, a cardiomyopathy that was going to eventually lead to a heart transplant. Wow. So they, they, could, they did some testing. It, it, they, I think they had their suspicions, but they had to do some testing. And I remember one test, they, it was a kind of this catheter test where they actually go up into the heart with this catheter. It's amazing what technology does. And I remember waiting in the waiting room, the doctor comes out and, and he just looks at us and he says, your son's going to need a heart transplant. Mm -hmm. He has restrictive cardiomyopathy, which is a, a disease that um, restricts the elasticity of the heart. So it stiffens the heart. Mm. So that was another one of those gut punches mm -hmm. where we just, yeah. it was not something we were expecting, even though we were meeting with the, with the transplant team, there wasn't, there wasn't a thought. That, that, that our son would need a heart transplant. He looked too normal. Uh, he didn't look like anything was wrong with him. Um, but in that moment, uh, they told us he needs a heart transplant. And then we also found out with restrictive cardiomyopathy, usually the life expectancy is two years without heart transplant. So as soon as you're diagnosed, they move immediately to heart transplant. And so we went through that process and Noah was listed. So at nine or 10 years old, he was listed on the heart transplant list. And um, that was a that was a challenging time. It was hard. Um, there's moments in our marriage where we've been unified, and there's been moments where we haven't. And 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 in that moment, I just remember thinking, my son looks normal. Why does he need a heart transplant? And I and I remember the fear kind of creeping in. Like I don't I don't think he needs this. Why are, why are we doing this? And and Melody was wanted to move forward with that with that yeah, transplant. Yeah, it's something I I wanted him to have. A heart transplant, but my fear was I don't want to watch him go into cardiac arrest and yeah. suffer and be in the hospital beating the clock, yeah, waiting for a heart. Um, so we were both kind of going through the motions really differently. I was like, let's get this heart right away, and Jason was saying, no, I don't want this for my child. It, yeah. it, was, just, it was another one of those moments where the Lord grew our hearts mm -hmm. in um, resting in his sovereignty. Right. And so I think we really actually came to unity, not, not because we both wanted to move forward in the same way, but we actually came to unity knowing that God's in control. Mm -hmm. And so God, God mm -hmm. ultimately has this. He's sovereign. And so whether the right thing is to move forward or to not move forward, God's going to move forward with his plan. Yeah. And so I think we were both able to, to really rest in, in God's sovereignty in the midst of, of him being listed. But the amazing thing is, is that 
they as as time went by and they continued to to monitor him, Noah was not progressing like normal restrictive cardiomyopathy patients would. And so he was listed for about a year, and then it got to the point where the doctors had come to us one day and said, we, we think Nova might be ready to come off the heart transplant list um, because he's not progressing. He's actually improved a little bit, which they were very surprised. They, they didn't have any idea why he would improve. Hmm. Um, so, so a year in, he, we actually removed him from the heart transplant list, and they monitored him for another 10 years. So he got 10 years um, where things were, were seemingly going normal. He still had that EKG. So there was still some serious things with him, uh, sure. but, but we were able to, 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 to delay that, that heart transplant. And then it was a couple of years ago when we, we finally went to the doctor and they said, you know, we're starting to see his pressures increase. We're starting to see his, his restrictive cardiomyopathy progress. And so that's when they relisted Noah on the heart transplant list. So he was 19, 19 at the time. Yeah. And um, so they, he had his transplant. It would be uh, about a year and a half ago that he actually had his heart transplant uh, completed. Yeah. Wow. And how is Noah today? Yeah, Noah's, Noah's doing great. He's, um, I mentioned he's a, senior at, uh, at, uh, in college. And so he's ready to getting ready to graduate hopefully in the spring. Um, and he's doing, he's doing well. It's, you know, with the heart transplant, it's, uh, it's not something that we were really familiar with. And we, we learned, you know, obviously when you go through these things, you learn. And so, you know, with, with a heart transplant, one of the key things is that the body immediately wants to reject that, that foreign object in your body. And so he's, he's on, uh, immunosuppressive medication that he'll be on for the rest of his life. And uh, that leaves him susceptible to a lot of different things because uh, he just doesn't have the same immune system that, that we have. And uh, so he's he's got um, a life of doctor's appointments and medical procedures, uh, but we're incredibly grateful for the way that the Lord worked, that God can heal in the midst of, you know, I, I think God can miraculously heal. Mm. Um, but God can also heal through through medicine. God created doctors. God created medicine. He created science. He's the creator of all those things. Amen. And so for 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 Noah to to receive this life saving treatment, or for Hannah to get this life saving um, surgery that she had through a doctor, is still an amazing example of God's God's healing in their life. Mm-hmm. Amen. Yeah. Does the story end there? We can't handle anymore. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's, that's. I mean, it really does end. I mean, with, and like they said, there's ongoing uh, surgeries in the future for all of us, really. And when my disease, you know, it's a slow progressive disease that will eventually, um, all the muscles in my body will completely lose function including my heart and lungs. Um, so yeah, it doesn't end there, but I'm really encouraged that healing will come. It's yeah. just a matter of time. Yeah. And that's when we get to spend eternity with Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So it may not come in this side of heaven, but it will definitely come. Yeah, and I can maybe even back up. I, I think I had, maybe I didn't mention, but so Noah and my wife actually share the same diagnosis. So they both have a form, this form of muscular dystrophy. As a part of that muscular dystrophy, sometimes there's a cardiomyopathy that develops with that. And so Noah has both the muscular disease and the cardio disease. So, um, so they share that disease. So we know that, that also in addition to Noah managing his, his, his new heart, that he's on a similar path to my wife. Um, so right now he's, he does have some muscular limitations. Um, but for the most part, he's, he's pretty mobile. He gets around and he's doesn't have significant limitations, but we know that at, at some point in the future, uh, that, that muscle disease will also progress for him and, and he'll likely follow kind of a similar path as my wife. I want to, I want to ask both of you, um, some really hard questions and I'm asking because um, we're talking about hope revealed. 
and before mm-hmm. we started before we started recording um i quickly learned that you have hope and melody you have already spoken about that and um so i guess i want to i want to start with jason and and um what's your day to day look like as far mm-hmm. as knowing what the future may hold uh, not only with, uh, I mean, really with Hannah, uh, with Noah, with Melody. Um, yeah. yeah. What does that look like for you? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's looked like for me, um, you know, as I've taken on the full time, really the full time caregiver role. Um, and so it's not, it's not how I envisioned you know, marriage to be, um, but but God's given me this opportunity to really serve. So as I think about serving, um, you know, you, you, the Bible talks about leading your wife, and but really leading is being is a servant. You know, Jesus was a servant, and so um, you know, this is giving me an opportunity to to really serve serve my wife well. Um, but there's challenges. I, I think, you know, sometimes, you know, we talk about this as story one, story two, story three. Um, you know, there's moments where um, it can become a, a bit overwhelming and you, you think about all of that, all that's transpiring. And um, and that goes back to what, you know, I kind of shared a little while ago was, um, you know, it's, it's a day-to-day battle. Every day it's waking up and saying, Lord, how do I be faithful with what you've given me? Um, we have these, these challenges. They're a gift, but they are hard. Mm. It is difficult. Uh, it's difficult to watch your children um, walk through significant medical conditions. I mean, it, you, you, for, most parents would say, I'll, I'll trade places with my mm. children any day. Um, yeah. And that's true. I mean, I would trade places as much. It's hard to watch them walk that road. But I've also seen, um, you know, we've talked about the way that God's grown us. It's amazing the way that God has grown our children, you know, in the midst. Mm. As a parent, you just can't create uh, that kind of um, experience. Not that you would wish that. You wouldn't wish any of this sure. um, for your children. But I've seen God grow soft hearts. I've seen God mm. grow compassion um, in, in my in my children, even as they've uh, even as they've walked through this. Um, so it's uh, I, I feel like on a, on any given day, I'm I'm, I'm playing the the dad role and you're playing the the husband role and it's you know there's there's a mix of you know normal parenting and a mix of you know how do i continue to to love and care for them well in a way that i just had no idea would be my role when we first got got married Mm. yeah that's amazing and it's a great perspective i think we can all learn from that um serving my wife now looks a lot different than it did before we talked and i'm grateful for that Mm. Mm-hmm. Melody, when you wake up every morning, uh, w- what's your mindset? What is, uh, we, we heard from Jason. Um, yeah, and I we're going to continue to pray that God will heal. But what's your mindset yeah, when you thinking. wake up in the morning? I get a little emotional hearing him speak because he's just such a gift in my life, and it really, it really takes him and a community of people um, to help me every day just to get up and get going and live my life. Every day I wake up in a lot of pain, and I immediately have to fight for joy, fight to get my eyes off of my circumstances. So I immediately have to go to the Word and think of others, how I can pray for other people, think about how the Lord has given me the humility and the eyes to see His faithfulness in this situation and really feel it as a gift and realize that He's put me in a position of total dependence on him so that he can get the glory. 
And that's what helps propel me forward and makes me want to serve him faithfully and really focus on, you know, different passages. Um, the passage in 1 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 has been a real anchor for me. As Paul talks about, no, our outer body is wasting away, our inner body is being renewed day by day. Amen. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. And I see him renewing my inner soul day by day. And he gives me patience and faith and peace and mercy. And I'm just so grateful. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's an amazing perspective. And again, I know, I know you both struggle at times. We're human. Mm-hmm. But to testify to God's love and his faithfulness and his goodness um, in your situations and what you've been through is truly inspiring. Mm-hmm. And um, I think as we as we wrap up here, I, I, I do want to I do want to ask you one, both one more question. And that is, um, again, we're, we're talking about hope revealed. Can you share with those who are listening and those who are watching who are also struggling, maybe not medical. We all struggle with things on a day-to-day, but sure. what kind of perspective can you give those who are listening and watching to encourage them to keep on hoping? Yeah. Yeah, I think if I just touch on that passage that, that Melody talked about, at the end of that passage, Paul talks about... Um, not setting our minds on the on the things that are seen, but on the things that are unseen. Because the things that are unseen are the things that are seen are temporal, and the things that are unseen are eternal. And I, I think that the the part that gets me up every day is not some hope that something will change in this life. I mean, I, I there, there's something important about praying for healing. I, I think that's an important thing to do. I think the Bible calls us to do that. But I think that, that passage is calling us to, to really set our minds on the eternal. And as we, as we think about the hope that we have, how do, how do we have hope? We get the hope from the Word, and the Word is pointing us to who God is, and, and God is, um, is going to redeem all things. Uh, I, you know, as Melody mentioned, you know, we, if we're not healed now, and even if we are healed now, if you look at every example in the Bible where somebody was healed by Jesus, they all died eventually. Mm-hmm. And so that healing was really just a force. It was just pointing to who Jesus was. But ultimately, our, our true healing was, um, was satisfied on the cross, that, mm. that, that God healed us from our sin. And so I, Melody and I talk about this all the time. Uh, we, we, uh, the, the, really, the gift in suffering is it's caused us to think about eternity with mm-hmm. Christ more. Mm-hmm. And we often think back about how often we had lived our life every day and we'd go through a day and we would never have thought, never had a thought that God is eternal. God is God's going to redeem us one day and we're going to be with him for eternity. But when you walk through suffering, uh, you begin to think about deeper things. Um, and that's where the gift comes that Lord, we, I, I, you've mentioned this before is, is, is being consumed with mm-hmm. eternity mm. um and so yeah so i i think we, we we don't place our hope in the things like paul says in the temporal things but in the things that are eternal mm. that's good that's good yeah and i i think trust is something thing um oftentimes i encourage people when they're walking through hard things that suffering is not the void of God's goodness for them. Hmm. You know, that God does draw near to the brokenhearted. And sometimes it looks different than what we're expecting. I think we are always expecting God to take the heart away. But God draws near to us in the ways that He feels are good for us. And sometimes that means not taking the heart away, 
upon helping us walk through and giving us what we need to help us walk through it. Such great advice from both of you. So as we close here, um, I know that I know that people listening to your story will be inspired the way that you've inspired me. And you guys inspired me years ago when we met. Um, something just stood out about you both and your family. Um, mm-hmm. You got to see your, your daughter when she was very small at the time. Um, but I know that people would like to connect with you in some way and maybe help out. Are there ways that people can do that who are listening and watching? Yeah, I mean, we can, my, my wife is more active on social media than I am. And so she, you know, we can, she's definitely, um, you know, is a good way to connect. She's also kept a blog. So actually when we started our adoption process, uh, she started a blog. And then as all of these different circumstances unfolded, it was just a way for us to keep people updated. And it was really just a way to bring glory to God. And so we have a, we have a blog um, that we keep updated, you know, fairly regularly. And and we're we're really in the process. We've we've had some some life changes here in, in employment, and so uh, we're 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 also in the process of really seeking the Lord. The Lord has given us this this circumstance, uh, these circumstances, and we think about how do we steward our financial resources, mm-hmm. but but also how how do we how do we put that same mindset into stewarding the circumstances that God has given us so that we can continue to, to glorify him as we live faithfully in the midst of that. So, so we're, we're in the, the process of, of exploring a few things where, where we might be able to, to do that. Cause we really have a heart. I mean, I think our heart and desire is to really encourage people mm-hmm. um, that they can walk through suffering, that there is hope in Christ. Um, and that one day God's going to remove the suffering, whether he removes it now or he removes it um, in eternity. So we'll put those links and, um, connection points in the show notes um, and we'll also put them on the screen as well um, we would love for you if you feel called to just reach out and encourage the lit saws and to um, uh, just however God calls you to connect with them uh, you guys I just want to thank you both again um, for taking the time out to share uh, your stories to be just very candid and uh, transparent we would be praying for both of you, all of you. And uh, Thank you. We, we would love to have you back um, mm-hmm. for updates. And, um, and in the meantime, connect with them on social media and you see, just look at the show notes and you'll find ways that you can help out and encourage mm-hmm. them. But definitely pray for them as well. Um, any last thoughts from either of you before we go? I am in the process of writing a book. So I look forward to sharing that win the world sometime hopefully next year yeah awesome let me let me be one of the first in line to have you back <laughs> on and let's talk about the book yes that's amazing yeah, we, we love awesome. yeah. Jason and Melody thank you so much again thanks Mike. Our, our pleasure